you know, California and especially the liberal city of San Fran in, in that area and how music really inf influenced you. Um, and, I, and I was in America when, Ray, um, not when, Ray Reagan, when um, Clinton was elected and he did seem a very central, centralist politician. He, apart from a few people, he, 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 there wasn't a sort of the bitter divide that you, you see now. Um, yeah. There were people who wanted to bring him down, but these were in the party. The, most people didn't you know, tear themselves apart when they talk politics as, as they do, um, as, they, as I would say since Obama, because even when Bush was in office, people weren't happy with the war. I think the war was something that divided a lot of people, but it wasn't as much of the politics as much as the war and needed to go in as opposed to, um, you know, what was the motivation behind that. When well, I noticed when Obama got in, it was very much the, the the right were very much of a this man is the worst thing ever, and we 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 oppose him with with everything, no matter what he does. We want to frustrate him, and you had a lot of the blacks who hadn't voted, who, who don't they take politics, hadn't really taken politics seriously, but saw the opportunity of history, and and it was a, a, a momentous opportunity to to say let's see what can happen. And but I think halfway through his term, most people were happy that they, he was in there, but I think people got lost interest much with, with politics. Uh, so we'll, I, would, I would want to hear from your journey, if, from your observation from you know, Clinton, um, Bush, Obama, um, and then we've got um, in, in the White House now somebody who, I think, I think if he if they announced tomorrow that he was caught stealing money from his neighbor's house, it wouldn't. Before that, would you know a smaller scandal that you'd have to resign like a Nixon. But it would almost be like, yeah. So and and it's almost um, yeah. It seems to be in a very different sphere now. But I think just on this. So I think if, we, if I go back and just say from you, if you can just. Talk about what your observation has been since, say, the Clinton years to to now, and okay. and, and 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 the journey. Um, when I moved to England, Clinton was president. That was 1999. In 2000, there was the election, and I jokingly said to my friend Steve, "If Bush wins, I'm going to emigrate." <laughs> I had only planned on living in England for one year, 20 years ago, and. <laughs> I, at that point, I think I knew I was going to stay a bit longer, but still thought, you know, I'll stay for a little bit longer, then go back. And um, Bush got elected, and I think two things happened. One was that sense of the, the triumph of ignorance that somewhere in the American psyche is, is an attitude of, I don't need to know anything. I don't need to be well-educated. I just feel this is what's right and this is what I'm gonna do. And there was a sense that that is what had propelled Bush. Bush's dad was very intelligent, yeah. you know, lifelong career diplomat, knew everything about the government. And it made sense that he was president. And then his son came along. It was just this sort of weird thing of, you know, some sort of Oedipal thing. And <laughs> what is this guy doing? And then when he became president, there was this other fear of, of, of the kind of marionette president. Of He was surrounding himself with really experienced ideologues. And he was just going to be this kind of likable buffoon who was being manipulated by people who actually had pretty sin purposes. Um, then 9-11 happened and that, that was very strange because um, that was the beginning of me being less American. Um, there was a definite kind of resentment in, in a, you weren't here, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. When, you know, if I would say something kind of a, well, we have been 
causing a lot of problem in the Muslim world for a really long time, and they have a lot of reason to be angry. And I'm not saying that they should have, you know, killed 4,000 people, but maybe had we dealt with things better for the last, you know, six decades, maybe this would have happened differently. Um, and it was just very much America closed up shop. And any viewpoint from outside America was wrong and was um, was really unwelcome. And so it, it was a strange thing because, you know, I'm American and I'd only lived outside America for a very short time at that point. And um, I think America became a more scared country at that point, a less confident country. I think America's might is now used in a more kind of reactionary way, um, kind of a flailing kind of a way. Um, I, I mean, personally, I find it really, really sad. And then, then you had Obama, and, and Obama was that inevitable thing of everybody wanted Obama to be a revolutionary. Mm. Barack Obama is not a revolutionary. Any study of him as a politician or a as a man says this guy's a compromiser this guy believes in process and how we get things done and who we involve is really central to his whole ethos and he was a great student of Abraham Lincoln who tried really hard to work with his political foes and you know brought them very close in to his administration during the Civil War and it, it, it was a bad dream in the sense that yeah. it was just totally unrealistic. You know, I, I remember he got elected. And I'm like, Guantanamo Bay is closing tomorrow. And <laughs> all these right wing things that have happened for the last eight years are going to be gone. And of mm. course he came in and he was like, well, I, you know, I want to work with everybody and let's do a bit of this and let's do a bit of that. And, yeah. and there were so many people on the left just shaking their heads going, I thought this was the guy. I thought this was the guy. Mm. And he was just, you know, amazing passionate guy probably the president at the wrong time and unfortunately was that guy who was the first black american president and there was always going to be one of those people but that was never going to be easy i remember the day he was elected they interviewed a woman in the street and she said it's just a shame they're going to kill him wow she had no doubt you know American presidents statistically don't survive very well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Something yeah. like a 15% mortality, right? And she just thought, you know, of course, of course somebody's going to kill him. So many white supremacists and racist people in this country, one of them mm. is going to get lucky and he'll end up dead. Mm. Um, yeah, and then, and then you move past that and man, I was sure Trump wasn't going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I was absolutely sure. And, um, I mean, before you ask about Trump, I would be honest because I, I, because mm -hmm. since um, I would say since the '90s, what will happen is every he he has a book he's gonna he wants to release, so he then says he's gonna think about running for president. They they always ask him as a customary thing, "Are you gonna run?" He says, "I'm thinking about it, and I'm a Democrat today. I'm a, you know, I'm a he'll, he'll support the Democrats in New York, and he'll so he was always back and front. So. When he said he was going to run, I'm sorry, here, here he goes again. He's probably trying to sell his show, you know, his show. Yeah, yeah. The plaintiff was going now, so that's, and I don't think he even thought he was going to go. I just thought, yeah, I'll just go with it. And, but maybe what Sarah Palin did with the sort of Tea Party, and they, I think they saw, I think, I think that shook the party, the, the Republican Party up, the sort of Tea yeah, Party, yeah. I mean, are you guys... Um, on the right are just being very you're compromising you're not really forceful and this sort of UKIP Brexit sort of Brexit sort of thing Tea Party movement and we're the silent forgotten and and they they tried to bring him in a fold with Mitt Romney and uh, when Mick ran but he wasn't really their guy so I think almost as if Trump spoke and they said okay he sounds a little like Homer Simpson but He's saying the right I would think so yeah, um, yeah but I'll, I'll let you go but I'm just yeah this some little context from my or how I saw it it's um I think the thing that doesn't get talked about enough is the Clinton Blair revolution of bringing the left to the center abandoned mm. a huge number of working class people 
who were desperate to hear somebody talk to them. And if you look at all those states that Trump nudged to victory in, Pennsylvania, Ohio, all those states, mm -hmm. they were the ones who decided that. And mm -hmm. it's hard to, you know, say, oh, that was stupid, because he was talking to them. And, he, you know, unfortunately, in the current world, he was talking a load of rubbish because he was saying, well, we're going to reopen old coal mines and we're going to make as many cars as we used to and all these <laughs> things that don't actually fit with the global society we have now. But, you know, I do think if I was an out of work auto worker and some guy came along saying, you're going to get a job back, trust me, I might have a go, you know, <laughs> I know the other person's not going to help me. So. But in his first sort of two and a half, three years, I mean, a lot of what he was doing was, you know, he renegotiated re 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 NAFTA, which they all thought he could do. He, he was put a lot of pressure on Mexico, uh, on, on some local companies, and his trade war with China, which no one else was sort of willing to do uh, very publicly. Um, it, it, it's almost as if people were like, well, this guy, has said it, he's actually delivering at the cost of anything. He did it America first. He's, he said it, he was pushing it. And, and, I, and I wonder if he, did you think, well, he's actually, apart from the wall, which in some cases he put some of it in there, but did you think actually he's actually, he made a promise and he's actually keeping to his promise. And someone, this is finally a politician who says what he, he's going to do. Did, did that come across? I think for me, Trump is so obviously not an ideologue. Trump is um, with a different personality. I think Trump actually has a working with other people kind of nature. It's just, I think his, his, his massive insecurity and his bullying nature really work against all that. Um, you know, if, if it's a strange thing because, you know, as a, for instance, sometimes he, he's done something where he's gone to given a political speech and he's made fun of himself and he's obviously made fun of himself and it was anybody else. People go, oh, there he is poking fun of himself. That's a really <laughs> admirable quality, but it's Trump. And so people are saying, he's so stupid. He thinks this is true. And obviously he doesn't. And, and so it's, it, we've got to this strange place where he's judged in such a different way that, you know, I, I, I would hate for that to go so far that, you know, God forbid historians look back and think, oh, he was treated really badly. <laughs> but let, let's not do that. <laughs> let, let's let him be written correctly because, um, you know, I think he's generally done a really abysmal job and I would hate for that to not get correctly credited. Um, in terms of him following through, I think, yeah, it, it, it's that thing of, a lot of the things he was following through with are things that when he proposed, I thought lots of people will agree with you, but that's a bad idea. Like building a wall. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the China things are a really strange thing because it's one of those things, it's so complicated. It's global macroeconomics. There's very few people on the planet who genuinely understand it. And the person I know who, uh, my brother-in-law is a CEO of a massive corporation. I talked to him about it when Trump was getting no good news about it. And he said, actually, it's, it, right now it's working. We don't think it's going to work long term, but right now China's actually a bit panicky. And, and that was interesting because that was coming from someone who deals in billions, mm -hmm. who, you know, understands how economics work in relation to governments. And, and he was saying, actually, Trump was kind of right about this up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, so those sorts of things that, that I mean, you know, if, if I'm going to ask for history to be written fairly, I guess I have to ask for that to be written fairly as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then we come to, we come sorry, to two, because we see the, the beginning part, which was the economic side and the jobs and, and the stock markets all rising and you know, unemployment was at its lowest going down. But then the global pandemic hits and we see a different type of leadership. And then not just the pandemic, we get to 
the Black Lives Matter sort of thing. And we just see almost somebody who just almost wasn't prepared for being a wartime president or being a, a peacetime president, as, as one would say, but being trying to be a businessman. And so what are your, how did you, how would you then look at the last six months? I think the, the two things that Black Lives Matter and global pandemic have in common is compassion, is that when you deal with these things, you're not first and foremost dealing with abstractions. You're not dealing with economics. You're not even dealing with pocketbooks that directly. You're dealing with people who are suffering in a very acute way that all individuals are feeling in some way. I think Trump has very little ability to emotionally relate to other humans. And I think that has, on the one hand, it's, it, you know, from a PR standpoint, it's been a disaster because yeah. when he stands up, you don't feel like he cares. Yeah. You feel like, you know, he's, he's going to say, this is all just smoke and mirrors. This isn't really a big deal. And where people are dying you know, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with Black Lives Matter, unfortunately, behind all that is this massive history of Trump with very overt racist rhetoric dating all the way back to, um, there was a, a rape in Central Park. Um, gosh, when was that? early 90s maybe mm -hmm. um the central park five and he was taking out newspaper ads saying these young guys need to be convicted these guys need to go away and they were all convicted and then all their convictions were overturned and mm -hmm. after they were overturned trump still said no but they did it mm -hmm. and if you ask trump supporters they'll still say oh yeah of course they did it even though the entire legal process has come out and you know mm -hmm. there's five black men who were in prison who shouldn't have been <laughs> Oh, <laughs>